You're listening to The Support Report with Be Present, where we share real stories from young adults and how support changed their lives. Hey, everybody. (laughs) Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Support Report. We are Be Present. I am your host, Justin Peters. And unfortunately, no Kiara today. She had some scheduling conflicts that that came up, so you'll have to catch her on the next one. But I am joined (laughs) by a guest, Melissa Miller, 13-year leukemia survivor. She also lost her mom to cancer two years ago as well. So we're going to talk about a whole lot of things, plus who knows, left and right turns. You guys know how I am. So <laughs> Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Justin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm I'm stoked um, to have this conversation. It's been a little bit while. It's been a little while since I've been without, without Kiara. So actually, I'm feeling <laughs> a, a little nervous right now, oh. <laughs> um, but I think you'll you'll be easy on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I promise. <laughs> let's let's start with your cancer diagnosis. So 13 years, I believe you're 24. Whenever you heard um, mm-hmm. the word cancer, what uh, yes. what were you feeling in the moment? Can you can you kind of give me a shape for what that what ha- that day looked like? Sure. Yeah. So at the time, I was living in New York City. I was working in TV production, kind of just you know living my life as a 24 year old. Um, you know, going out just you know, having fun. And I started to have some symptoms, um, nothing, you know, too crazy. Like I had swollen glands and I noticed I was out of breath a bit. Um, and, um, I was, um, going to visit my parents and my general practitioner was still, um, you know, there. So I had made an appointment and, um, you know, they said to me, um, we think you have mono. And I was like, I don't have time for mono. Like, what is this? You know, I was, you know, naive. Um, Little did you know. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Then I was like, I wish I had mono. Um, But um, then they said, you know, our phlebotomist is out today. Normally they had one in the office. We'd like you to go to, um, you know, the ER just to get some blood work and a chest x-ray since I was, you know, having some some, you know, issues catching my breath. Um, so I did that and, um, went to my parents' house. I was there for a few hours. I think I was eating dinner and I got a call from the on-call doctor, um, you know, from my GP's office saying, you know, she was like, are you like, okay? Are you standing up? Like, are you, you know, she's like, you have a very high white count and I don't even understand how you're functioning. And I was like, I mean, I have those few symptoms I mentioned, but otherwise I was fine. I had just been working. I had just been out, you know, I was okay. Um, she said, you know, go back to the ER. Um, they'll do blood work again. And the ER doctor said, you know, that he really hoped and thought that my blood work was a mistake. They messed something up and, you know, they would redo it and I'd be, you know, on my way. Um, so they did the repeat blood work. I went to the ER with my parents and the, um, you know, they brought me into same night. Yeah. This was all the same day. Yeah which was, which was crazy. I mean, what a long um, day. I was, yeah, it was a very long day. I was lucky in the sense though, that they like kept on it because you always hear from people who, you know, got sent home and, and things like that. Um, but they brought me into a room and the ER doctor did not have the best bedside manner. He told me I had the worst diagnosis for someone my age. And, um, you know, um, he said, you have acute myeloid leukemia. We'll need to confirm it, but we know that's like the only thing it could be pretty much. Um, And so they admitted me and I didn't leave the hospital for six weeks. I never went back home. Um, I was transferred. This was like the local hospital. I was transferred a few days later when they felt comfortable enough, you know, transferring me to a cancer hospital. Um, But I did not go home um, for six weeks after that. And it was just, it was a whirlwind. I mean, I don't remember a lot of the first few days. I, you know, they, I had pneumonia. They needed to take care of that before they could um, start treatment. But I needed to start treatment like yesterday at that point. And it was, you know, it was, there was a lot of, I had blood transfusions and platelet transfusions and just all kinds of, it's really, it's, it's definitely a whirlwind. I mean, I don't remember much of it. Hmm. And what was your experience with cancer prior to that? Did you family, friends, anybody that you really knew of? no. Nobody, nobody. I remember the first thing, actually, I remember when they said it to me, the first thing I thought was, um, I had this like phobia of vomiting, like a really bad phobia of vomiting. Um, and all I could think was like, I can't, I can't, you know, how am I going to have chemo? Like, I can't even vomit without freaking out, you know? And I thought 
about losing my hair and you know all the things that you see on tv you, that like that's what you immediately think of with chemo right um and that stuff does happen obviously but there's a lot you know a lot of other stuff as well um but no i had no personal no personal experience with it um, um it you know, still sometimes feels like I'm, I had an out of body experience, you know, it literally feels like I like stepped out of the room and it was, it was someone else. Um, yeah, nobody, I mean, nobody in my family had any, any experience. Um, and I did treatment for a year. I was inpatient for treatments. Um, and I had blood, uh, um, blood and platelet transfusions for hundreds of them in between each treatment as well. So it was about a year of year of treatment in and out of the hospital. Um, and, you know, it, it was crazy at, at 24 because, you know, people just didn't know how to, how to handle it. People my age, they were, you know, going out, having fun, just, you know, I I can't blame them, but it was hard. It was hard, you know, to feel like I couldn't relate to people my own age anymore. Um, that was a big thing. And, um, it, you know, it, it was very isolating. Um, and, you know, it took it took a really long time after to, to kind of feel like I was integrated back into young adult life, if that makes sense. Yeah. Tell me more about that. What do you mean? Sure. Um, it just, you know, I felt like I was in just such a different place. A lot of my friends were getting engaged, getting married, starting to think about, you know, family planning, things like that. And I was, you know, I wasn't able to. I wasn't able to work. I wasn't able to date. I wasn't able to really, you know, I mean, I was in the hospital isolated for almost a year. Um, and I just, I couldn't relate. And when they, you know, small complaints to me just seemed like nothing. And, you know, we were just living very, very different lives, you know, than, you know, other 20 somethings. Um, and my, um, my diagnosis as well was, you know, rare for someone my age. So I also wasn't meeting a ton of people, you know, who had gone through the same, the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were you in with other like adults or more on the pediatric side, kind of like the weird in between? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. I was, I was with adults, but I was about 50 to 60 years younger than the majority of them. I figured so. Um, (laughs) Yeah. It's, I mean, at one point I was like, I just want breakfast for dinner. They had to bring me the pediatrics menu, <laughs> like, <that> was, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, it's just such a weird, a weird place to be. Um, and I met um, the only other person at the time who had the same diagnosis as me, who was, I think she was, she was about 10 or so, 10 or 15 years older than me, but she was still closer in age than, you know, anyone else. Um, I met her and then. I don't even know, a few months later, she passed away. And that was like the first real experience I had with this being real, if that makes sense. Like it was just such a blur to me. And then, you know, I met someone else and we were going through it together and we would email all the time. And she was just a great, you know, a great support. And then she died and she had, you know, young kids and just, it all became so real to me that, you know, we're literally fighting for our lives here. You know, before that, I think it was just so, you know, you have to take one day at a time. It's fight or flight. You do what the doctors tell you, you get through it. And that's really, you know, you can't, it's, it's very hard to like think beyond that. Um, It's just so scary. Every day is something you haven't experienced before. Every day is something new. And the only way to get through it is to just, you know, day by day, but that really, really hit me hard. Um, And I think that sort of like changed everything for me. Um, And the fear just became more, more real. Um, And and we're definitely going to get into trauma as well, because there seems like there was a whole lot of trauma, especially how fast that came on. Like one day you just go into the doctor's office and then you're in there for six weeks later, a year later doing treatment, which is just Mm -hmm. bananas to me. Honestly, I had... I really appreciated you um, posted your a picture of your 35th uh, birthday on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And and part of that comment, you're like, I, you referenced, you're like, I may regret this picture, but <laughs> getting older is a privilege, especially for those who were told that they likely wouldn't see this day. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying it's a silver lining, but going through an experience like that and having cancer, I'm guessing, and I've heard Kiara speak on this all the time as well. 
gives you such an appreciation for life. And every year that passes mm-hmm. that turning 30, turning 35 is mm-hmm. not, I'm getting older, but thank <laughs> God for another year. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's such a, it's such a double-edged sword too, because for me, I feel like, I feel like I lost a lot of my twenties, right. In the hospital, you know, and then dealing with mental health health stuff after as a result of that trauma and everything. So I feel like I lost so much time and I feel so frustrated sometimes on what I, what I lost and what I missed out on. But at the same time, exactly. It's like every year, you know, that is a privilege. And, you know, when you start also getting to know a lot of other people in the young adult cancer space, you, you lose a lot of people too. And it really makes you, you know, there's the survivor's guilt part of it, which is a whole other thing, but it just really makes you, you know, appreciate it and not, you know, say, Oh, I'm so old, you know, like people do that all the time. And I'm just like, well, getting older is is a privilege. And I think that is what one thing I try and be, you know, as much as you know, I struggle a lot in, you know, my daily life with my mental health and other things, I really try to, you know, appreciate that. I mean, I was told I don't even remember, I, I tried to never, you know, go by stats and things like that because we're all individuals right but you know it was something like a 25 percent survival rate for my you know five years survival rate for my kind of cancer so it you know it was it was real um yeah mm. and is that where do you feel like that was the onset of a lot of the mental health um problems that you're facing then and and probably still now or was that pre pre the diagnosis no it's definitely definitely a result of i think um it it feels so strange at first because you feel like you're the only person like you're like oh i'm done i'm done with treatment like why don't i feel great why can't i like just go back to my life and then when you meet other young adults you realize they're having the exact same thoughts as you um you know you're worrying every single day about you know relapse you know every, every cough every cold, you know, and it does, it evolves, it changes as the years go on. But you know, you still, even now, it's still in the back of my head anytime I get sick, you know, is this just a cold? Or is my cancer coming back? Or, you know, mm. anytime I have some symptom that I had back then, um, you know, that lives with you forever. Like, I don't think that's ever going to fully, you know, fully change once you've gone through that. So, so you have that part of it, that getting sick is not just getting sick, like it's, it's scary. Um, you have that component. And then just, you know, the things that, you know, you just the things you deal with in the hospital, the tests and the, you know, bone marrow biopsies, and, you know, just the treatment and how sick you felt and losing your hair. And, you know, there's a lot of um, identity stuff, I think that happens as well. Like for me, my hair was such a big part of my identity. And, and, you know, losing it was like losing a part of myself. Um, And, I felt so insecure for so long. And um, yeah, and I think, you know, that that trauma and stuff stays with you, you know, get, it gets better, it changes and evolves, but it, it stays, it stays with you, you know, when you go through something like that. Um, and, you know, for me, that was kind of unearthed again, my mom, you know, was diagnosed with cancer um, about three years ago. And um, she passed away two years ago, she was my biggest, my biggest support. Um, and And a lot of that trauma was, you know, re-earthed at that time as, as a caregiver, as somebody who had gone through all of that, you know, um, so that definitely, you know, resurfaced a lot of things. Was your mom, your primary caregiver during your diagnosis? Yes, she was. Um, um, she sat with me, you know, every day at the hospital, um, every single day that I was there, she was you know, right there with me. And it was also hard when she got sick because it was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and I couldn't be there for her in the same way that she was there for me. And that was really, really hard. You know, I barely, barely saw her in her last year of life because it was when we were like, you know, quarantined. Um, and she wasn't, she had a major surgery. She wasn't allowed to have any, you know, visitors in the hospital. And then, you know, I would go to the house and I would mask and that was fine, obviously, but it was scary because I felt like anytime I went to visit her, I could be putting her at further risk. Um, And that was really hard for me too to not be able to, you know, support her in the way that she supported me. Yeah. Yeah. COVID was not gentle to 
people that were going yeah. through cancer. It's right. that's that experience is isolating enough. And then right. you put all of the restrictions on top of it and not even restrictions, but the people that are just like, I, you are autoimmune compromised right now. I cannot yep. show up. I don't know what I'm bringing. And I cannot mm -hmm. imagine going through that experience, let alone going through that experience during that period of, of right. life. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, we were, you know, it was the very, it was the beginning of things and her surgery got moved and it was kind of like, you know, our fear, the fears that everybody was talking about were like actually happening, you know? Um, yeah. Her surgery got bumped. She was at a cancer hospital but they had COVID patients. So they had to move all surgeries. And it was everything you heard about in New York was actually happening to, you know, to us. And, you know, and now I still have these like, what ifs, you know, what if she had had her surgery sooner? You know, there's always things like that that are in the back of my head. Ugh. Um, Yeah. That's challenging. So it was, it was tough. And, and like I said, just, I think the fact that I physically couldn't be there all the time was, was really, you know, the hardest part for me, but um you know, I know she, I know she felt my support and I tried to, it was hard too. Cause I tried to be there for her without being there as like, you know, this is what I did. And this is how I, you know what I mean? Because it's hard when you've, you know, when you've got, it, it was totally different. I mean, she had a different rare cancer, completely unrelated. I had all this testing done because I was really curious if there was anything genetic there and there wasn't, um, you know, we had totally different experiences, different times in life, obviously all of that, but you know, it's hard not to be like, well, have you tried this? This worked for me, but you know, we don't always, we don't always love when people do that to us. So I was trying to be, you know, a little bit, uh, you know, better about that with my mom. Um, but yeah, it was hard. It was, it was hard in, in so many ways. Um, and you know, now it's just, it's so hard not having my, my biggest support. And I feel like I took some, some steps back in my, you know, um, mental health just because, you know, I'm just always, you know, missing my, missing my mom and missing that and trying to kind of figure out, you know, where to find similar support. You know, it's like your mom, you don't have to feel bad calling her in the middle of the night or, you know what I mean? Waking her, things like that. It's like finding, you know, other people in your life that you're not, you don't feel like you're trauma dumping all the time, but that, you know, you can kind of get that same support. Um, I mean, therapy is great. Um, but you know, I can't do it seven days a week <laughs> and, you know, um, you know, and financially it's tough as well. Um, but you know, I'm lucky that I am able to, you know, um, to have a therapist that I've had a relationship with for a very long time. And, you know, she knows my, all my health history and all of that, which is helpful. Um, but I think, um, the support component and, you know, friends who thankfully have not been through, you know, their own trauma or, you know, some of them have, but it's different, you know, it's, it's finding that, that place to, you know, get that support without, you know, kind of, like I said, trauma dumping or overdoing it. It's like this balance that I'm always looking for, you know, with the people in my life. And um, it's been two years since my mom died and I'm still kind of trying to figure out that, like that support and that, you know, day to day. Yeah. I, I think I'm, understand what you mean by trauma dumping, but, but can you elaborate on, on what you mean there? <laughs> sure. Sure. I, I think, um, you know, I don't know. I hear that. I hear that term a lot, I think in the, you know, in recent times, um, but, you know, just, you don't always want to be that person, you know, you know, calling up a friend and always, you know, just talking about your own issues and your own problems because they might be bigger or more serious or whatever. And, you know, you don't always want to be, want to be that person. I know people don't, you know, not everyone has the capacity for that all the time either. It's not fair. And, you know, um, and friendships should be balanced. And, um, so yeah, it's, it's still hard because, you know, I'm talking about, you know, the trauma I experienced in the days leading up to my mom's death. And they're talking about like a wedding or something, you know, positive. And so it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to find that. And like I said, not feel like you're the one, you know, doing that because, you know, I mean, I want always looking for the joy too. That's a big thing, you know, always looking for the joy. Um, you know, I try very hard. I'm always searching for that despite everything, you know? So, but sometimes you just need to, need to vent, you need to get it out there. Right. So, yeah. 
and oh God, you got a whole lot of trauma in your life too. Like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> like that, it, I, I do not envy you for that. And I feel like it would be very hard yeah. sometimes to pull back whenever you're listening to a friend, not even about the positives, but the small gripes in life. If it's, oh, my, uh, you know, taking the wedding thing, for example, my cousin can't attend the wedding anymore because of X, Y, Z. And like, that's their complaint to you at the time. And you're like, holy cow, like I'm, I'm still grieving my mom that passed away, like let alone 13 years of trauma from cancer too. like chill out here. But at the same time, like <laughs> you can't dismiss their feelings and the experience that they're going through either, because those are moments that are frustrating for them in context of their life as well. Exactly. That's exactly it. And that's something I've been working on for 13 years and something I've been learning and trying to get better at. And, you know, you can't, it's, it's hard sometimes. Sometimes you want to dismiss those things that are little, but like you said, that's their, the context of their life. That's what they're dealing with. That's what they're going through. And I don't want them to go through, through things that I've gone through either, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's definitely a delicate balance there, but uh, you know, the way you said it is, is exactly what it is. And, you know, it's not, I always say it's not the trauma Olympics either. Right. I mean, <laughs> we're not trying to compete to see who has it worse. Like that's not, you know, that's, that's not what it is. Like it, you know, everything's relative. Right. So, um, you know, that's something I'm definitely working on. Like constantly is, is trying to find that balance and try and, you know, being there, be there for people, you know, regardless of what it is that they're dealing with too, but it's, but it's definitely hard. What happens when you, vocalize your suffering and then someone is dismissive to that and to buy you a little bit of time to think about that answer too you had a really good repost on your your instagram here i am just calling out like your entire instagram <laughs> which is melissa in the city if you want to find it and follow along we'll call back out at the end of this conversation but you had a great repost post that was a reminder that you said if you vocalize your suffering to someone and their response is dismissive it reflects poorly on their ability to provide support, not the validity of your experience. And I feel like there's a whole lot of truth in that. Um, but I think sometimes that can be hard in the moment too. Yeah, I think that um, I definitely experienced that a lot more when I was when I first got sick, when I was in my early 20s, because people just did not know what to say, what to do, how to handle it. I would not have either if the tables were turned, but it was hard and I lost friendships because of that, you know, um, I don't know that we necessarily had the best like conversations about it, or if I vocalized it the best back then. Um, but definitely I lost friendships, drifted apart from people. It really, it changes, it changes things. It's, um, you know, and when you're really in it, like when I was first sick in the first few years after, like you just, you, you don't have the capacity for anything else, right. You're just trying to survive. And, and um, so that was hard. I think now I'm better about trying to vocalize. If somebody that I really care about is dismissing me, then I, you know, I try to let them know. I, you know, like I said, I think friendships should be, should be equal. And, you know, I want to know if I'm doing that as well. Right. So, um, but again, it's hard because sometimes you're just like, oh, well, your problem is silly. And I know logically that's not, that's not fair. And that's not, you know, that's not cool, but you know, sometimes trauma brain does that. Right. So. That's fair. Did you have any of those moments as a care caretaker with your mom? Of course, like uh, so many of the, the caretakers we speak to are not necessarily um, able to channel that experience because they've never had cancer before and they, they don't really know some of the, the inner feelings that, that come with that. But your situation is very different and becoming a caretaker for your mom. I mean, you had some real life experience and you might be able to even guide your mom to an extent, but at the same time, did you ever get pushback from her or maybe not even pushback is not the right word, but I feel like you, you probably understand where I'm going with this question. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, like I was saying before, like we just had a very different experience. And so sometimes trying to relate our experiences wasn't always like the best thing to do. Um, you know, she had major surgeries and she had multiple different kinds of chemo and radiation and things that I didn't, you know, deal with. And, you know, 
her cancer was, you know, stage four when she was diagnosed and, you know, just a very different experience. But then sometimes I found myself saying, you know, like, oh, well, but I was 24 when I was sick, like, you know, and, and, you know, just so I was like, verbalizing that it was a very different experience. And yet sometimes that was hard for me not to try and try and relate it and try and, you know, um, share that even though like, yes, it was both cancer, but it was just completely different. Um, oh, and along those same lines, something that I always say is I felt like my mom and I also had very different, which is, which is sad, very different treatment, um, from doctors. It, that was really interesting and something I would love to learn more about. Um, you know, I felt like as a 24 year old, you know, they, didn't see a lot of patients my age. And it was very much like, oh, let's like, let's save her. Let's make her like the, uh, you know, this statistic, this positive statistic. Let's like, you know, um, we're excited to see her. She's young. She's not, you know, I wasn't a difficult patient, you know, relatively speaking, like things like that. And then, you know, it was different with my mom. I felt like they were almost like, well, she's stage four. She's, you know, she's difficult. She's this, she's, you know, like it just, the treatment just felt so different. And again, another way, like I learned that how our experiences were, were so completely different. And I think that's also something as I've met other young adults too, is really learning, like, just because we both had cancer, we can relate on some levels, but everyone's experiences are so individual, you know? Mm. Man, that's tough. Um, Melissa, as we wrap up this conversation, conclude this conversation, I'm just kind of curious with your mom's diagnosis, um, sarcoma, if I have it right. Yes. That name has not come up in this podcast for me yet. And I'm this very novice um, uh, uh, cancer person over here. And um, I was just doing some quick research before this to to kind of learn a little bit about it. It seems like it's a fairly rare cancer, um, especially in adults versus, versus children. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Is there, do you have a passion now for rare cancers and helping with some treatment? I, I, I was also reading something from you too, that you were, you actually heard about the diagnosis while you were planning your 10 year mm-hmm. cancer diagnosis anniversary. And I think you were doing yes. some fundraising around that too. And maybe you even were going to like pull the plug on that just because, of a little bit of resentment on cancer, like it, that hit a little different, you know, your 10 year anniversary, mm-hmm. hit a little different now knowing that your mom was diagnosed. Um, but anyway, it seemed like inside of that, you were raising a fair amount of money for rare cancer. Um, yes. that kind of tied back to your mom then and some passion there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was tough. I mean, she was literally diagnosed within days of like the anniversary. Um, Wild. and yeah, it was, absolutely, absolutely wild. And, you know, I really wanted her to be there and we weren't sure if she was going to be able to make it. And she did. And it was really the last place that she went to for, you know, something that brought her joy. So I'm glad that she was able to be there. Um, but, you know, and it was right before the pandemic and there were just so many factors and, you know, ultimately I'm glad we were able to, to, you know, celebrate a bit and raise money. But, um, yeah, I didn't know what I was, what I was going to do until the last minute. And, Um, it was just crazy that we both, you know, had rare cancers, completely unrelated, like very, you know, um, and, um, you know, it's hard. I kind of, I haven't fundraised since then. Um, I think it's taken me a little to, um, you know, kind of want to, you know, be in it so much much. Um, and that's sort of one of the reasons I wanted to, you know, come on the podcast and I want to start sharing my story again. And I think hopefully that will, you know, kind of make me want to go back into fundraising and all of that as well, because I am very passionate about, you know, rare cancers. And, you know, if you have an experience, you likely know nothing about it. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to get back out there and share my story, which is, which is really important to me. Well, I appreciate you reaching out and us being able to be a a conduit for you sharing your story. It's been an honor getting to have this conversation with you. Thank you. 
where people can connect with you. We've called out your Instagram a couple of times now. Can you remind mm-hmm. us again, um, where can people find find you on Instagram and connect with you? Sure. Sure. Uh, Melissa in the city um, is my Instagram handle and I'm fairly active on there. So if anybody wants to reach out. Cool. And that's Melissa essentially dropping the A off of Melissa. Yeah, exactly. In the city. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, so Melissa, final question for you. Sure. And um, this is a curious question for me now, coming from the context of both a um, cancer patient and survivor now, and also a caregiver to somebody, mm-hmm. what what does great support look like for you? Like both from when you were a patient and receiving that, and also some of the things that you learned being a caretaker to your mom? Sure. Um, I definitely think I've learned a lot recently. And I think the biggest thing um, that I've learned with support is asking people what they need. I think a lot of what people do is assuming what they can do do for someone else. And they usually have great intentions, but a lot of times that's not what the person needs. And I think we need to be more comfortable asking like what, you know, which of these things would be most helpful for you or what, you know, can I just sit beside you? Can I be like, just really reaching out and seeing what people need rather than saying like, oh, this is when I'm free. I'm going to drop off, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, it is or something like, um, you know, a lot of times I feel like I said, people have very good intentions, but it's more about them than about the person that they're trying to support. And I just, like I said, I think if we can all, you know, take a moment to actually stop and, and ask what the person needs, I think support would just be so much better. I couldn't agree more. And that's a major through line throughout most of our podcast episodes. Um, So I'm glad it's popping up back here again for you. Sure. (laughs) Melissa, it's been a pleasure. Um, Thanks so much. Once again, Melissa Miller, Melissa in the city. We'll have that all in the show notes. (laughs) Melissa, it's been a great time chatting with you. Thank you so much. Thank you.